my name is Hopper. I am one half of the binge warmers, and I've got to say, I love Willie Wonka. The original book was written by Roald Dahl and published in 1964. This got a film in 1971, then another adaptation in 2005. Now we have a prequel focusing on Wonka and his adventures before he got the titular Chocolate Factory. I'll be honest here, I'm not a huge fan of prequels. I don't love unnecessary backstory, if that makes any sense. Most of the time, prequels feel like soulless cash grabs after a character or a story is proven super successful. The Hobbit and Fantastic Beast movies are the first ones to come to mind. The studio always steps in and makes decisions that make the film suffer. This is also true in sequel series, but it's two sides to the same coin. Speaking of bad sequels, the Star Wars movies are a great example of how to do prequels. I know they're controversial, they're not the best movies, but I genuinely think George Lucas wanted to tell the fleshed out backstory of his universe. Anyways, those movies do their own thing, and they have references and callbacks, but feel very different from the OG series. But I do think that's important for a prequel, to feel different. That makes those good prequels, in my opinion. Anyway, this video isn't really about Star Wars. It's about the child-torturing chocolatier Willy Wonka. Now, we know nothing comes close to the original movie in terms of quality or performance, but I do still want to analyze Wonka and see how it kind of stacks up as a prequel. Throughout this video, I'm going to tell you kind of what I think makes a good prequel, and I don't have any basis for saying this stuff, but I think you know it when you see it. Like the Planet of the Apes films are a great example. They don't feel exactly like the original Planet of the Apes movies, but they've got certain similar elements and we see how the original films came to pass. Okay, let's talk about the story here. So Wonka comes to a fancy city to sell his chocolate. He is broke, so he finds a cheap B&B &B, and he accidentally signs himself up for indentured servitude. He meets other unfortunate souls and they start selling chocolate all over the city. Everyone loves this, but the secret chocolate mob and the crooked cops try to stop this new organization. They even poison Wonka's chocolate when he has enough to rent out store space. The crew then sets out to stop the wicked chocolatiers. With the help of an Oompa Loompa that Wonka sort of stole from, they expose and defeat the bad guys. Willie obviously succeeds and builds his famous chocolate factory. A lot more happens, but that's just sort of a short recap. But right off the bat here, I think this is not Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. We don't have like a bunch of kids learning a lesson. There's nothing like that. The plot is completely different. The only real similarities you can draw between Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and Wonka is that our main characters are dirt poor. But even then, that creates this interesting parallel between Charlie and Wonka. Wonka is penniless because he has no family. All of his family, his mother, has passed away. And he spends every dime exploring the world trying to make his chocolate the best. Poor Charlie, while he is younger, has to stick around and provide for his family. This new backstory for Wonka actually makes Charlie the best choice to take over the factory. He's from humble roots, just like Wonka. With Wonka's tutelage, he'll be the perfect person to run this zany factory. But now let's talk about the whole world and how this informs the original story. As far as the actual physical setting, it's a mix of like London, Paris, maybe Prague. Uh, this is smart because the 1971 movie feels like it could take place anywhere. It's important to understand that this is a fantasy world or dry fantasy. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever coined that term before. I can relate it to like Mary Poppins or Paddington or something very British in nature. By the way, did you know Paul King directed Wonka? He's the same director from Paddington and Paddington 2. Oh, and hey, he also directed a bunch of Mighty Boosh episodes. That definitely fits the vibe too. Let's do it. Okay. Go on, Bolo. <laughs> Anyway, back to Wonka. The crew behind this movie created a lot of physical sets, and you can tell. Very little green screen, it's a dream. You know, that's what you want as an actor, is to have it practically there in front of you. It's the opposite of acting across nothing in green screen. Most of this movie looks really great. It somehow feels more authentic, especially when the visual spectacle is important to the story and the dry fantasy elements. There is a bit of wonky CGI as well, but the film operates on this elevated reality anyway, so it never really distracted me too much. The best scene to illustrate this idea of dry fantasy is when Wonka first starts selling his chocolate. He's giving it to people, they start eating it and flying around and singing. It's a whole thing. Like, if I ate a chocolate and started flying in real life, I don't know if it would be whimsical. I would probably start crying and throwing up. But the scene works for the movie because of the elevated nature of it. It feels like musical theater in a way. You can make the case that the chocolate tastes so good and that's why they're flying. But no, it's microscopic bugs that you eat and they fly through your butthole when you're done. That's all stated in song, by the way. I love that. <laughs> That's actually very important to the Willy Wonka lore, I think. It's not just that he's magic, but it's a little more complicated than that. Like Wonka has been around the world and seen many strange and wonderful things and then turned those things into chocolate. In this logic, giraffe milk macaroons make you feel more confident because giraffes are tall, I suppose. It's the same logic behind Violet turning into a blueberry or Mike TV shrinking down to be sent by television. 
I think that aspect of the story is true to the first movie, although it should be noted the chocolate from Wonka seems to be a little bit more magical than the chocolate from the original. Like, for the most part, it's just normal chocolate. So let's get into the cast and talk about some of the performances. Oh, not you, Timbo. We'll be coming back to you since your performance is, like, one of the more important elements of this video and this prequel critique. Anyway, I really liked most of the cast and all the performances. I was really pessimistic going into this movie. I thought we would get some mention of the kids from the original story, maybe a post credit scene of Charlie or something stupid like that. But no, we were treated to a whole new thing, a new cast with quirky personalities. Wonka gets thrown into indentured servitude, and that's where he meets his whole crew of people that help him start sneakily selling chocolate. The most important of the crew is Noodle, a young girl that was abandoned as a baby and forced to work at this bed and breakfast slash laundromat type place. Anyway, Kala Lane plays this jaded child that is cautiously optimistic of Wonka. She basically becomes the brains of the operation. I interpreted this as the reason for why Wonka would want a child to be his successor later in his life. I thought it was very subtle, but it's an important detail to add to an origin story like this, and it's also not rubbed in your face. We also see Wonka's enemies, Slugworth, Fickle Gruber, and Prodnose make up the chocolate cartel. They pay a corrupt chocolate-loving cop to get rid of Wonka, and he ends up gaining a ton of weight and stuff. They also keep their chocolate under a cathedral operated by a cleric that has a sinful relationship with candy. It's just fun. I mean, there's so much imagination and whimsy packed into these characters, even the villains. It helps a lot that they're all, like, really funny British comedians. We have Rowan Atkinson, Patterson Joseph, the Olivia Coleman, Simon Farnby, who is also a co-writer, Matthew Bayenton, lots of ghosts actors that's an amazing show check it out if you haven't keegan michael key he's not british but he is incredibly funny matt freaking lucas is in this you don't get better british humor than matt lucas but hugh grant certainly tries to honestly the people that i talked to that watched this movie said that hugh grant oopa loompa is their favorite thing and although it did give me nightmares i really did enjoy his performance as well it is pretty uncanny though like his face does not match his body proportions like they cgi'd the body and he pretty much only could face act it's a synthesis of my face photographed by lots of tiny cameras attached to a sort of helmet and CGI. I never had to do hair and makeup or costume on this. It's one of the joys of, of a film like this. Lovely. Honestly, I didn't get the casting until I started listening to Paul King interviews. And then, yeah, oh, it totally clicks for me after that. I wrote him a very brief email that sort of said I've been thinking about Oompa Loompas and they're reading their stuff in there. Uh, sarcastic and <laughs> judgmental and uh, very funny we thought of you. And, and we thought of you and um, would you like to do it and he more or less wrote back saying okay very quickly i think the whole cast is pretty charming i'm sure i left a ton of people out but there's so many people to mention there's music in this you could call it a musical the songs were composed by neil hannon and joby talbot it felt like neil was just the perfect match it, there's a sort of timeless quality to his songs that I felt sat very well with the kind of uh, Anthony Newley, Leslie Bricker songs that we all know, Pure Imagination and the Oompa Loompa song and, and, and the songs from the 71 movie. Let's just be honest here. The songs do not hold up to the hits of the 1971 movie. That soundtrack only has one problem and we all know it's Cheer Up Charlie, the most fast forwarded scene in home movie history. Side note, I did used to go to church with a lady who really loved Cheer Up Charlie and she would sing it just around church. If you like it, let me know in the comments. I, I ever Everyone hates it for whatever. It's not a bad song. It's just bland and forgettable. And we're trying to get to the chocolate factory. Hurry up, Charlie's mom. Why are you singing? Otherwise, these songs feel timeless. They'll still be relevant in like a hundred years. The Candyman, banger. I've got a golden ticket, banger. By the way, Grandpa Joe, you don't have a golden ticket. Charlie has the golden ticket. All you have is to explain for why you've been stuck in bed all day, making the poor child go out and work in the sawmill. While you're just chilling there, are you depressed? You know what helps with that? Sunlight. Go get a job in the fields. Why don't you? <laughs> I didn't mean to get that dark. I'm sorry, Grandpa Joe. And your coke finger, weirdo. Pure imagination. Banger. I want it now. Banger. All the Oompa Loompa songs. Bangers, of course. Listen, the prequel knows everyone loves these songs, so they straight up just use the Oompa Loompa stuff and pure imagination. Honestly, I see this as necessary for a prequel of this scale. I mean, the movie needs to invoke the feelings of the other movie, and the memorable music of the past is tied to all those feelings. It works for me. Specifically, the Oompa Loompa stuff, because that's the only way they sing in the original. Like, that's the song of their people or something. The rest of the songs feel like Broadway, and that's not really a bad thing at all. How could it be? Broadway is amazing. They fit the tone of the story and all the musical numbers have awesome choreography. How am I not supposed to love Noodle Noodle Apple Strudel? That's so fun. Come on, bro. The whole scene, I just had a big smile on my face. He's milking a giraffe. They're singing about nothing rhymes with Noodle. It's really funny. You should watch the film if you haven't seen it. Uh, but here's the deal, right? Timothy Chalamet 
great actor, great performer, not the best singer. Singing, you can yeah. sing. Uh, yeah, we I try. It's a lot of auto-tune. No, I'm kidding. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I like him a lot. I'll see anything he's in. I'm looking forward to Dune 2. And those popcorn buckets. He does do a really good job, though, and he's so fun to watch. He is like this optimistic salesman guy who makes a unique product that no one else could really replicate. He's a magician. He's sort of driven by his poor dead mother and her love of chocolate. She gives him this note that is the secret to her chocolate, but doesn't teach him how to read. There's a Guardians of the Galaxy type moment where he opens up the last chocolate bar his mom gave him, and he learns that the secret is to share with those you love. That is so touching, and it warms my cold, dead heart. My only real problem with this interpretation is that he doesn't have a dark side, or he didn't seem suspicious. I think he is genuine and optimistic through and through. For instance, in the book, when Augustus Gloop falls in the chocolate river, Wonka's not like clamoring to save the poor child. He's He's trying to get him out of there because if he goes to the fudge room and gets made into fudge, it'll taste awful. He could care less about the safety of that big fat nincompoop or <laughs> whatever they call him. Gene Wilder strikes that balance perfect. It's half wonder, half insanity. This Kane scene is all you really need to know about the character. And I've heard it was Wilder's whole reason for doing the film. Johnny Depp does a lot of things wrong, but I think he gets the darker side of the character. Almost too well. Look at this mother. I don't think I want my kids taking candy from him. But maybe the business world makes Timmy's Wonka sort of aloof and bitter. Looking at the cold, hard numbers makes him a little bit colder and harder. It gives him that mysterious edge. This kind of works for a prequel. That's the whole point for this video, right? So I think that works. I don't think his performance or any performance could outshine Gene Wilder, but it is miles better than Depp. I don't want to dunk on that movie like so many others have because it has some good stuff about it. Some of the jokes are funny and it's technically closer to the book. I mean, the backstory is dreadful though, even if the amazing Christopher Lee plays Wonka's dad. All these years, and you haven't flushed. I think the character works better on a love-filled backstory as opposed to a weird, spiteful motivation to stick it to your dentist father. It's sort of hard to define what makes a good prequel a good prequel. I think a big part of what made this work for me is that they did so much different. A lot of the stuff led into the next movie, like he finds and, and builds a chocolate factory, obviously. But it wasn't like he, someone gave him a hat and a coat. It, like Solo is a perfect example. Like We don't need to know how Han Solo got the name Han Solo. It's almost cooler if we just have the character and he's named that. You know what I mean? It wasn't like someone looked at Willy Wonka and said, You're a bit wonky. Hmm. Yeah, your name should be Willy Wonka. Because you're so wonky. We don't need that. Don't put that in there. It's refreshing to not see like a cash grab prequel. So give it a look. It should be streaming around the time this video comes out. Uh, that's the reason I uploaded it this late not because i had to retool the whole thing that's about all i have to say i can't believe i walked into this movie trying to hate it walking out of the theater i was like man this is dumb stupid i tried writing a video about how you know you ruined a mysterious character by fleshing out his backstory that's not true that's not what this is paul king deserves way more credit i will never doubt the man again researching the video and trying to make it why this is a bad prequel I couldn't do it. This is a good prequel, and I had to flip my script 100%. Let me know what you thought of this movie in the comments down below. Thank you for liking and commenting and subscribing. Also, it should be noted we're doing more video essays on this channel, me and Steven. We've also got our Ben 10 podcast that comes out on Mondays. We love doing that. I hope you love watching it. Also, check out our community tab. We have like fun polls, and like we have some community stuff. Keep on binging.